in three, two, one, let's roll. Hello, dear listeners, viewers. I have a wonderful person with me, Mark Ryle. He's from Canada. Yes. Nice, nice to have you here. Th thank you so much, Jira. I'm uh, really thrilled to be on your show, uh, Being the Genuine Athlete. And uh, yeah, I'm from Canada, uh, near Toronto, which is just near the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario there, a place called Hamilton on the west side of the lake. Thanks for joining us on this podcast of Being the Genuine Athlete with Mark Ryle and his story, how he developed himself and his daughter, how he was a parent first, building her daughter's character, personality, his daughter Stephanie, and how he wrote a book, Run Daughter, Run Father. So how he put his daughter first and then himself managing, contributing, coaching, and developing everything. Let's hear his story. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for being on the show because I see you as a person who transformed himself and along the way also daughter into a genuine athlete. Uh, you have many PhD, many science, mathematics, you write, write books, you have many things. So please introduce yourself a bit with your own words, your expertise and your field. Sure. So I'm, I'm a retired teacher. I just retired a couple of years ago. I taught economics. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I, I have written two books. And hopefully we can talk more about my second book, which is about running and, and involves my daughter. You mentioned that, my daughter, Stephanie. And I wrote those two books just after I retired. I had some more time on my hands. So it was a great uh, opportunity. Uh, and then while I was teaching, I was very, uh, a very active runner. Uh, and I also coached uh, running track and field and cross country running, which was my first love in coaching. I really, I really loved coaching that sport. So uh, that's a bit about me to start off. Great. Uh, I was um, in in already in primary school and then high school always a runner because as an athlete, professional table tennis player, we always did a lot of preparation, physical. And when we did these runs, like competing in primary or high school, uh, I was always there. I wanted to be first and I love the cross country style, the nature. So tell me, please, about you, why you fell in love with running. Sure. So I loved running um, a little late in high school. They tried to get me to come out and run and I didn't want to. So I, did, I didn't know what I was missing. Jerry. So uh, uh, and my phys ed teacher would say, Mark, you've got to come out. And I never wanted to. And I would, uh, in the school run, the uh, I would win the big race and beat all the people on the cross country team, even though I wasn't training or on the team. So that's why he was actually quite perturbed with me by grade 11, because I still didn't want to run for the school. But then grade 12, so we had grade 12 and grade 13, the last two years of high school, I, on my own, um, joined the team and I, I never looked back. I loved, I loved it. And I even ran some marathons in my early days, uh, in my early 20s in university. But I got injured, Jerry. I got injured. This is back in the 1980s. So, you know, you can imagine back then. When I was born. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> back then they didn't even have you or they didn't have many orthotics. You know, orthotics you put in your shoes. They were just starting to experiment with those. And I needed those. I didn't know at the time. So my knees were taking the, I was pronating too much and my shoes were getting bent and my knees were, you know, just... There was no protection, no orthotics. So I didn't know at the time, I just quit. I had to stop uh, when I was 24. It was very disappointing. And if, in fact, I remember um, after that dreaming about running a lot. Um, it was still in my mind. It's still part of my genuine self. It was, I still re replayed races and competition and training in my mind, uh, in my dreams. So um, fast forward now 20 years. So now I'm 45 years old and I'm sedentary. I'm not, that's not my genuine self though, right? And that's, that's something else. And uh, I was working hard. I was teaching. I, my, my life was good. I'm happily married and all that. But, and we had one daughter, Stephanie. She was at this time, uh, eight, seven, seven, almost eight years old. So let's say seven years old. And she said to my wife, uh, she didn't know I used to run. She didn't, I, I never mentioned it. She said, I want to go run around the block. And my wife said, why do you want to do that? I said, I want to tie myself, she said. And, uh, and then I asked her, why, 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 are you, uh, you know, why are you jogging? She said, well, we have a school. Um, she's in grade three. We have a school thing, and we're going to go to the cross-country race in, in a few weeks. And 
I want to prepare. And wow, I just couldn't believe it. So I had to um, get off the couch and uh, find some running shoes because this is in the big city of Toronto. I couldn't let her just go running around on her own, right? Seven years old. So I went with her and it was, I sort of got a kick out of it, you know, like going a kilometer with this little girl, really, my daughter. And she, she took about twice as many strides as I did, you know, but we we're going about the same speed. It was very easy for me, right? But for her, it was like, and uh, I'll never forget that. That changed. Uh, I mean, that was a start for her, obviously, but it was also changed my life. It brought me back into the running um, sphere. And, and uh, I don't think I would have done it without that little impetus, you know, her, she, that's why I call the book Run Daughter, Run Father. Yeah. Daughter, daughter first. Then the father followed in her footsteps, literally. I, I love it. I love the story. Um, I actually didn't have parents uh, that were athletes. They were more workaholics and working all the time, but they supported me. They came watch some of my games in table tennis that I played. Um, and now I, I've ran so much that actually a couple of years ago, I need to stop running. And actually I wanted to stop running. And then when I picked it up again, I figure I I found out that I have a quite serious injury on my right hip. It's a bit uh, cartilage is used. I still can run, but I don't practice it. I walk with the dogs and move. Yes, I want to move. I want to be active, of course. But uh, I miss running because I was running really a lot all the time. And I love your story. How because a lot of times it's like at and sons or daughters are. Uh, going into a sport and then all these crazy parents want to like project or through their you yes. know, kids get back that kind of feeling of winning without them doing it yes so them being crazy and just pushing kids and like you know doing it but in the, i love your story because it was vice versa your daughter just brought back the love that you had and you picked it up and you did it for yourself because you're also before we dive into the book you're also a uh, avid uh, triathlete, uh, you've competing. Please tell us about that. How you've came back to competition? Yeah. So uh, um, now I am now sixty three. So now we're going forward another eighteen years. In that eighteen years, my daughter did a lot of very competitive running. She's still running right now. She's twenty, just turned twenty five. So she's at a pretty high level. And um, I got I got pretty competitive too. So I won the Canadian Masters five k championship. Uh, yeah, for 50 and over, which, you know, older, but still, still competitive. And then I, um, <clears throat> I did some half marathons and all that. I didn't try a marathon again. I, I just felt it was too much, but I did some 10 Ks, half marathons, five Ks and whatnot. And then, um, around six years ago, one of my buddies who was a triathlete, a guy named Chris, he's a super, super dude guy I taught with said to me, Mark, why don't you join me for a, a bike? A cycling thing and i said chris i don't even have a good bike have you seen my bike it's just terrible you know um and he said well I, i'll lend you this other bike i've got a second bike it's pretty good for the roads so i went out with chris and i i drafted him all the way i was right behind him you know <laughs> which in biking gives you you know helps you keep up with the guy if he's a lot faster you know but um we went about 50 60k and i really enjoyed it it was it was different because i felt like i was um floating you know, I felt like this was really nice. I'm floating on, the, there was no pounding on the knees. No, uh, you know, it's different from running. I love running, but it was a relief. It was a change. It was a floating sensation and a wonderful workout. No eccentric muscle contractions, right? Everything was concentric, uh, no stiffness afterwards. We went for two or three hours and he actually complimented. He said, you did pretty good keeping up with me. You should look into doing a little more biking. And that's how that started. And then I got into learned how, learning to swim, which I'm still not that great at, but I'm still learning. And um, now I'm pretty serious competitor in the triathlon. Yes. Wow, great. And your daughter, she's also doing the triathlon? No, I have a funny feeling she may try. I've never really, you know, asked her straight up, but she does do some cycling. For example, this summer she cycled from British Columbia down to um, Oregon, to Eugene, Oregon, to wow. watch the to watch the um, World Track and Field Championships. So her and a friend went that ten days, about I don't know, almost a hundred kilometers per day, 
on tour bikes and uh she she enjoyed that so and she can swim too but now right now she's focusing on um tr- um cross country and she's done some trail runs too some some of these ultra things where you go like 50 kilometers or 25 kilometers 50 miles in the trail she she likes that too okay so please guide us now a bit into the book but i want it i want to hear the perspective if you mention it in the book in that way how you as a dad needed to change or needed to anyway she brought you from the couch but then later on in the story as your story of running develop how you needed to also change in the character wise or in the approach wise that your daughter stephanie could accept you listen and be guided by you yeah so that this is a a crucial part of the book so it's very exciting when you're coaching your own daughter and a lot of other people will say very nice things about her you know she won that race or she did like for example, if she ran a 1729 5k in New York when she was 14. And so that was a big invitation of race. She got she was the one Canadian invited down there. And that's a pretty fast 5k for a 14 year old. So um you're getting a lot of these accolades and you're sort of getting swept swept away with it all by it all, and you're her coach and she's excited, you're excited. So you got the important part i write a whole chapter about this is not being um drawn into that what they call the parent trap which is you are now living your success through your son or daughter and you're pushing them harder because you want them to do even better it's sort of like this cycle right and you get it all wrapped up in it so and running this is really important for most listeners probably know this but running is a late specialization sport there's no need to run your run yourself into the ground or do your run mega miles of so many races when you're only 14 or even 18 uh because most runners don't even peak till they're almost 30 distance runners so and there's the danger of her getting injured and burnt out and, and there there are even some female uh specific uh issues that can come in there's the female athlete triad and things like that where bone density and yeah, in Manorea, all those things. So we, were, I was reading about these. So she was she, to her credit, and we were pretty cautious, um, not raising too much, not um, keeping her mileage down to. I, I don't think she was doing, you know, even twenty five kilometers per week, even when she was thirteen or fourteen. So she was pretty careful, um, and watching, giving her some time off, and making sure if she played a hockey tournament or some a big soccer tournament, she consider that running and don't then try to run on top of that that weekend like be careful with your body right so um that that's so as a parent i had to be very careful there um as coach and parent to try to pull her in and um sort of temper her enthusiasm a bit which is something it's it's hard to do actually Mm -hmm. and how did you come across the female triad um, and how did that reflect on you coaching her like you already mentioned but if you have any story anecdote or something specific that you can dive yeah. into yeah well there's lots of other athletes who have suffered from that i guess it ties into the female the period and whatnot and and if, if they if they become so thin and push themselves so hard they don't have that that event once a month so uh things their physiology changes then their bone density gets affected and then when the bone density goes down it can impair their bone um uh, the strength of the bones for for the rest of their life so it's really important to not push females so hard that they become so skinny that they become amenorrhetic and then um suffer from uh these overtraining syndromes and it can happen to guys too it's not just i'm I'm learning more about this there's a hypogonadal syndrome too where men um and their hormone levels get affected by overtraining yeah i'm talking about young men so um luckily we didn't push it so hard we were reading stories there were american girls who were running like alana hadley and um Brianna, I can't remember her last name, Yaskivit or something, were running 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers per month uh, as, you know, 13-year-olds, running marathons, doing really well, um, getting coached by their fathers. And um, they, you know, unfortunately, you know, 
they they suffered the consequences um so you know i'm glad we were careful we butted heads my my daughter and i butted heads a lot over this and she talks about it in the forward to the book she says i was hard nosed and my dad was always trying to push hold me in drunk really in, and i wasn't i i argued with him a lot we had we had some arguments over this it wasn't easy yeah it's an important subject to and a team to touch and to dive into because a lot of as you mentioned parents lose the focus fall into this trap uh, a lot of athletes being young feeling that they have the energy they can do everything they're invincible yeah until until the body gives the price and the body always wins if you don't respect it and acknowledge it um, yeah. i heard the information a scientific one that actually the body sends more than 80% of signals through the sensors that it receives as a feedback back to the brain and the brain sends only 20% or less back down the problem yeah. is that we live in a society that is vice versa it's 90 head i can do it i will do it i need to do it i'm going to win and 10% we we uh, acknowledge and and um, allow that the body we accept the information so that's why the injuries and all this abuse of body actually happens um please touch more about the uh, probably you mentioned this in the book that like you mentioned now in between the lines that you care more about the person and you care more about the process than the athlete and the results uh, yes. the, the, the mileage yeah exactly so i actually have a chapter about that too where i talk about training regimes and training or regimens where um you know maybe a famous coach or somebody has a has a method then everybody follows that and um i caution against that because um it's there's no every person is unique every human being is unique every athlete is unique they have different lifestyles they have different physical and mental and sociological um needs and and talents so there's no way that one regiment can fit everybody perfectly so i really caution against um being caught what i call it being a slave to one um philosophy or regimen and to be very open minded i think uh, one of the best spokespersons on that was uh, you probably remember sebastian co who was a great olympic um, 1500 meter runner mm -hmm. <clears throat> his father peter co coached him and peter co wrote a book called uh, winning running it's an excellent book actually and peter um learned a lot about running he he wasn't officially a coach but he learned as his father as his son grew up and as he coached his son and in winning running he says the best training regimen is the one that's holistic it's holistic in other words it takes into account the entire person and what they need and um, i really like that the way he said that have you uh, how much have you done the mental preparation Which mental is very important um there's lots of they could give you a short term example and then more of a longer thing a short term before a race uh we were always important it was always important for her and I to find a place not maybe near the starting line like 15 minutes before somewhere off to the side maybe 4 or 500 meters away where you can relax do a few strides stay warm and just um just you know not get too carried away and all and then maybe just a minute or two before you you would go to the starting line and take your position so that 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 mental stuff we always worked on um also in a race try to relax um one of the best runners in the united states uh desi desi linden desiree linden she won the boston marathon she said uh, and I, i love her quote too she said um when you're when you're running a race you've got to relax and let the run come out of you just relax and let the run come out you can't force So I think she actually said you can't force fast running. You've got to relax and let the run come out of you. So we we worked on that too even in training we tried try to get my daughter to relax, try to smile a bit almost as you're coming in near the end of an interval. Even though you're even though you're in you're suffering and you're pushing and you're breathing hard, try to see if you can smile a bit. It's really, you know, just learn to relax. And uh but long term another good example is um my daughter um like a lot of uh actually like more females i would say um she progressed when she was young 14 15 year old and then she dropped off this happens in running males tend to have more of a linear 
progression. Females, when, when they're when they reach puberty, hormonal change and body shape changes, they tend to some of them will drop off, and then it may take a few years before they start coming up again. And that exact thing happened to Stephanie, and she it was very frustrating because she when she was twenty years old she couldn't run as fast as when she was fifteen. Um, she just couldn't hit the times even though she was training more, <laughs> she was actually training a little more and uninjured, never injured in any, in any time. Uh, only now when she was 23, 24, did she start breaking the record she got when she was 14, 15. So she was for seven years mentally, it was so difficult and it, for her ego and for her, for herself and for like, why, why, you know, just that's very hard to accept, but she just stuck with it. She grinded it out kept running. She always liked running. She liked training. And then just the last two years, finally, she's been rewarded with some personal best again in the 1500 meter and the 5k. And uh, so we'll see what happens now. But that's tough mentally when you're that's not just a plateau for one year. That's a six or seven year plateau. You know? Yeah, that's that's why it's important to have a strong foundation mentally, emotionally, and that you love running yeah. or whatever occupation your activity you're doing because then you get through when you have this vision yeah. and uh, i love it when you mentioned the desiree quote and how she said let the run flow through you or come out of you yeah yeah i'm doing in the last couple of uh, years i'm working a lot because of my own uh, disability in a way my hip condition i needed to find something that would help me gain back and come out of chronic pain because it was chronic. And I found the method AEQ, it's Aequitas in short, it's called the equilibrium in a way, so that you balance. And it actually uses the clinical somatics, if you're familiar with, and there's no stretching, it's only prolongation, it's relaxation. Okay. So if I want to stretch a muscle, I need to use force, but I can just relax it. And when I relax yes. it, it's not there are benefits, of course, for stretching. It depends on what level and how you're doing it. But prolongation is that you understand the physics, the mathematics and everything, the gravity, the forces. So if I want to, you know, relax uh, my, my uh, front body, I just need to relax it. I don't need to use a lot of strength and force on my back. Yes. I can use double less if I relax my front. But yeah. if my front is subconsciously, you know, tense, then I need to use the double force on my back to create a right. movement. And it's the same with running. You hit a wall, you hit a mental, emotional, physical wall that you can forcefully break through and pay a big price, as some do already pay. Um, and that's, that's sad news for them as kids already, juniors. Uh, or if you learn how to relax and let the run come out of you and through you. Um, Please elaborate maybe on this and add the regeneration after the games, after the running, after the these uh, runs. How did you and Stephanie, how do you and Stephanie regenerate? Yeah, so the uh, regeneration is interesting. Sometimes it's, um, it's just do something completely different, you know. Um, so you can actually do it with the running too so I, I know it sounds strange but how can you get away from running through running just run in so many different ways fun ways try different things so so we tried some very creative workouts where it's almost like a different sport but you're still getting that physiological <laughs> benefit so for example i remember one there was one we were in prince edward island on the east coast of canada on vacation and my daughter put on these crocs like these shoes these uh, shoes that you can lock in the water with with rocks mm -hmm. and crocs on the rocks i guess <laughs> so she put those on she was on the beach i think she was about 12 years old she ran into the water right kept going until her head was under the water there was some stone under there she touched then she turned around came back up slowly emerging from the water pumping with her legs and her arms and then came to where my wife and i were standing and then ran around along the beach uh where the waves were washing up to this uh wooden stump that was maybe 300 yards away touched that and then came back to where we were and then rested for maybe a minute and then did the same thing again back into the water so we call the we call the workout the crocs on the rocks but anyway so we uh 
you know, and, and for her, her, actually, another way to regenerate was when, when she was, um, that's more of a short term thing, a long term thing. When she was uh, flat uh, plateauing for that lengthy period, she started experimenting with trail runs, ultra trail runs. And that was really good for her because when you do a 50K trail run with all these elevation changes and the trails in the forest and all that, time your time really doesn't mean that there's no standard time you're not okay how come i didn't get uh 432 for 1500 meters or 1710 for five no that's you can throw all that stuff out the window it's just you and the forest and you're trying to do your best 50 kilometers and and uh so you could be out there for five hours or whatever and or more and it, so that was great for her because she really enjoyed the running the experience and the camaraderie with the other uh uh, crazy runners too that 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 yeah. uh she she did one one that was called the bad thing and it really was quite the that's a good name for it because it was quite the course but she she actually survived and didn't hit the wall and she made it through and she, the look on her face she was just overjoyed when she finished and uh mm -hmm. and she won the women's division in that race without even uh that was her first um ultra and anyway it was good for her it took her mind off the track and the cross country for a while and the standardized times and it, it was it's not completely different but it was still running she's it was still the genuine her doing her genuine athletic uh running yeah you, you begin to enjoy when you become more limitless or you expand the limits at least yeah this is how i play table tennis as well because we play it first until 21 and then the rules change or till 11 to reach the set to win the set. And I said, you're, you're playing against 100. It doesn't matter if you reach one, nine points, 11 points, 15 points, you just play, just play. Because if I had that end point in my mind, I was so stressed, I lost. When I said, just just play, just play. A lot of yeah. times an opponent came to me, give me the hand, gave me the hand because they lost. And I was like, what? We're still playing. And he's like, no, check the result. You, you won. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. So in that way, it's good uh, that you mentioned this. It's an interesting, uh, uh, like, yeah, regeneration style. Um, Maybe please touch as well, before we wrap up everything, how you encountered and how you came to the recognition, you yourself and with your daughter then as well, because there's a lot of time that athletes demand perfectionism and, you know, athletes like professional ego as well, and all the stuff that are like driven, uh, like ego driven. You you be, you demand from yourself these results, but actually you're not doing the regeneration, no meditation, no massage, or little physio, the nutrition, forget about it, psychology, like it's like so low, but you demand this result. How did yeah. you uh, close that gap that you figured out and you understood? Look, if you want this, you need to do all these things that this result demands from you. Yeah, just keep learning. I'd encourage, you're, you're, I'd encourage all your listeners, keep learning as much as you can about nutrition. And uh, like I made some nutritional mistakes. Uh, I did one half marathon where I tried losing weight uh, the week before the race. And I, I was going to lose weight by not eating any carbohydrates. <laughs> so yeah, I lost weight. But when I got to the starting line, I didn't have any glycogen in my muscles. <laughs> so I was wondering why about halfway through the race, I was going at a really nice pace, that me, me light and light footed and all that. But about halfway through the race, like I'm running out of energy. What happened? I mean, this, is, this shouldn't happen in a half marathon. So uh, nutrition is so important. That was just a basic thing that I did wrong there. And my, my daughter, she, she had to experiment too with physiology because she had also had exercise induced asthma, which, um, would affect her, uh, if the, if the weather was really cool and crisp, cool, crisp weather or hot and humid, like sort of extreme type weathers. And so she had to learn to, um, uh, be very careful. She took her medical puffers and all of it. That 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 didn't necessarily protect her. And um, uh, there was one big race. Race we went down to Pennsylvania. We got an invitation down to the big uh, Penn Relays in Philadelphia, and she blew up in that race. She and actually it was a normal day. It wasn't. We I was surprised because it, it was a perfect day. It wasn't cool and wasn't too hot. But at about four laps in, she was running right with Hannah DeBalzi, the best American runner 15 year old right with that group with han and the others and then she just started going backwards and i thought oh my god what's wrong and then she as she came by she pointed to her throat like i was at the edge of the track and that meant i can't breathe she just couldn't breathe so she had an asthma attack unfortunately in that big race so um as it turned out the wind was there was a lot of wind that day and the pollen from the forest near philadelphia was just whipping into the city so 
that's why there was a lot of pollen in the air. And uh, but the, it, that was a long drive back for us because you get so pumped up for that and you're so happy to see her you know going toe to toe with the, some of the best and uh you know she's trained in everything and you know one kilometer in she her breathing ties up she can't breathe of course she can't run if you can't breathe right so the long drive back and that's where i had to stop being a coach and just be a father and we we we, we told silly jokes we sang songs we we did whatever we could to take our minds off that race right we just we just uh distracted ourselves and tried to make it a, a positive ride back. And so she, you know, that's not diet necessarily, but that's part of, that's one of those things. It's one of those other things that all athletes have to watch out for. There's medical things, there's diet, there's all the psychology we've talked about, experience. Um, and then, uh, of course, just the basic training, which is so important too. Um, and part of my book is, I'm yeah, I'm celebrating, you know, the sharedness that I had with my daughter, which is a wonderful father daughter thing. I, I love that. And I, I'd love to share that with the world, but we're really trying to share a lot of the things we learned. Uh, like I got that story about what I did wrong with carbohydrates before that half marathon. I've got that right in there. You know, here's a stupid thing I did, you know, watch out. And uh, we talk about harassment attacks and there's lots of stuff, lots of ups and downs in there that um, we learn and then we portray them. Sometimes they're just funny stories too, but um, uh, the things that we learned that over 20, almost 20 years together. And uh, so I'm hoping that older runners like me and younger runners like her will have, will get, will learn a lot reading, <coughs> reading that book. Yeah, it's good that you are having and in a way life and daughter pushed you to be holistic. So that you can share a holistic book, that you don't just write your uh, times and how what you achieved, but you write the whole holistic approach through the stories, through emotions that you had, that you uh, encountered in your career, both you and Stephanie, and uh, how you connected, because probably you felt your body as well more when you learned more. You were more in tune with yourself, like Stephanie probably also is more in tune uh, i presume you also barefoot sometimes run barefoot oh, or yeah. something because it's there's a, a lot of yeah there's a lot of discussion about barefoot running and we did we have done a fair amount of that or minimalist running like maybe with the vibrant five figures on and things like that or low heel shoes i'm i'm not necessarily against that at all i think for some people it can be great and depending on the terrain and all that right i, I wouldn't do it on a rocky uh, yeah of course trail run but um you know steph ran a couple cross-country races uh with five fingers on and uh because they were flat grassy courses and they were great and they're nice and light and natural and mm -hmm. all that so uh yeah it's it's fun the, the things you learn and um I, I have a big discussion about minimalist shoes in there and barefoot running uh, awesome uh to wrap it up uh mark can you explain and expand in your way what do you see yourself your daughter stephanie and any other genuine athlete what does it mean to you to be genuine well yeah genuine means it is the true you and a lot of us go through the phases in our lives where we're sort of pushed for whatever reason into a little bit away from ourselves and uh you sort of have a gut feeling when that might be it could be in your career in your business um uh in your relationships or in the sport so for me it was the sport i i well i wasn't doing i was doing a little bit of sedentary maybe a bit of golfing but uh, nothing you know so for me i had gotten away from my genuine self and I think it's really important for people to, um, and you'll know it when you're there. You'll actually know it when you're there. For you, it was table tennis and whatnot. For me, it was running. For other people, there's, there's, you have to be patient. You maybe have to wait a while. Maybe like me, you'll have to rediscover that thing, do a re-debut, you know, into it, um, to let it take hold of you again. Um, and may other people will not know yet, but if they're just patient and keep. Uh, learning, they will, they'll find something, whether it's in their career or in uh, their athletic pursuits, or it could be an artistic pursuit too, right? Where, and it'll, it'll, um, 
they'll know when they've hit it. it it'll just resonate. It'll resonate. Uh, it'll, uh, what's the word? It's sympathetic vibration right within you. It'll be, it'll feel right. And, 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 and you, it'll be the real you, genuine self expressing yourself, whatever it is. You know. Yeah, the joy. Thank you very much, Mark and Stephanie, for being, for running, and for your book. Thank you so much for hosting me, Gary. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like, and comment, and be genuine all the way.